Today we are here at Miss McLaughlin's home for her interview on October 25th, 2010. So let's go inside and listen to her story. Today we are here interviewing Miss Anne McLaughlin. Thank you for taking your time to allow us to perform this interview. Miss McLaughlin, you were born in 1921 and worked for 32 years. Can you tell me about your teaching years at Cambridge Narrows Community School? About my days at, the, at Cambridge Narrow School? Yes. At that time, when I was out at Cambridge, it was not called Cambridge. It's not, it was not called Cambridge Community School. It was a different type of school. It was Cambridge Rural High School. And uh, I went to teach there in 1954. And uh, I was there for a total of 32 years. And I was principal for the last 17 years. Can you tell us a little more about your teaching years and experiences? Well, uh, at that time there were, if I say, seven to twelve uh, enro school enrollment and we had an average of probably, uh, at one point we had about 235 students. And we, had a, we had one grade from seven, each from seven to twelve. But we, that year, we had to split our grade seven. The maximum that you could have in a classroom is 35 students. And we must have had over 65 because we had too many for one class. So we had to split the class and we had two grade sevens that year. And the next year we had a split seven and eight. And uh, outside of that we had, normally had one grade of seven to twelve, and uh, it was uh, it was that school was quite a uh, an upgrade from what we had had before because from this area students had to go to Gagetown or Fredericton to go to high school, and this meant that everybody could go to their local school and our school was. Uh, we didn't have a, a strict laboratory, or we had like a make-do laboratory in our grade 11 classroom, and we had a few sinks built in and a, a lab cupboard and so on, but we didn't have a, a proper lab. But we had a good music program. We had a music a woman in the area that was an accomplished musician, and she was very, very interested in music in school and we we had a full-time music teacher and we had a music festival and once a year and we had various functions like that. Can you share some stories about when you started teaching about your family? Well I was born in Douglastown which is on the Miramichi River and there were seven, I was the oldest in the family of seven. And uh, I spent part of my early school days at my grandmother's in Tavison Tack. And when I was in Tavison Tack, I went to the rural school that had a, it was like a, one, a grade one to eight class. But then the, when I would come home to Douglastown, there was a four room school. And I would go to school there. So I split my first eight years of schooling between those two schools. So I was familiar with what an eighth graded one room school was like because I had gone to school in Tavison Tack. But then for high school, I went to school in Chatham at St. Michael's Academy, which meant that you had to get up at six o'clock in the morning and walk, you know, like 20 miles all uphill type of thing. <laughs> We had to, in the winter time we had to walk across the river on the ice, and in the summer time we went on the ferry, and that was how I acquired my high school. And I went to my first year of teaching. I taught in an eight, 
a one-room, eighth-graded school, and I had 65 students on grade one to eight. And we had a classroom, and the, uh, I had a classroom assistant. And that meant that after I did the teaching, like the math and the English and the reading and spelling, the grade one and two would go to the classroom with the assistant, and she would do the drilling and, you know, testing and so on. That was my first year of teaching. And after that, I progressed to other, another one-room school. And my first uh, bigger school was in Charlotte, up in the northern part of the province. And uh, that was a three-room school. And I did the intermediate. I was grade five, six, and seven, I guess it was, yeah. And then I taught a year up the Tobik River up uh, Red Rapids, and that was the eight. That was eight grades too. And then I took a year off. I decided that that was during the war, and everybody was leaving to go to Ottawa and to go to Montreal and to here and to there to take up other types of jobs. So I went to St. John, <laughs> and I. Uh, I uh, went to work in the civil service in the, the Department of National Defense where they called up the soldiers. And I, taught, I worked there a year. And then I thought, oh well, I miss teaching, so I went back teaching. And that's when I came to this area, to Coles Island. And I taught there in the, uh, it was a two-room school. And the big room, as they called it, was grade 7 to 11 at that time. There was no grade 12. And I taught there three years. Yeah, three years. And then I got married and moved down here and to Mill Cove and started to teach in area schools around this area. And finally, when they built a new school at Cambridge, well, I had two small children by then, and I didn't go to teach there the first year. But the second year that the school was open, <clears throat> I went and uh, I taught in the school there. Can you tell me about your home life? Well, I was the oldest in a family of seven. And uh, at that time in... In the Miramichi, there was very there was some hydro. In Newcastle, there was a, like a private sort of a company that produced hydro or electric power. We called it then because it wasn't hydro. It wasn't water. It wasn't coming from the dam. But down where I lived in Douglastown, there was no no hydro whatsoever. So everything had to be done by hand, of course. And, washing and cleaning and there was no vacuum cleaners, there was no electric washing machines and there was no electric dishwashers, certainly, nothing like that. So there was plenty of work to do and uh, they, we, there were four girls in our family and we all had to work at uh, after school and Saturdays were quite quite busy. We didn't have much time to run around the roads. <laughs> and uh, the, we didn't get, uh, when I was at Teachers College in 1940, we didn't have any electric power. And uh, when I came home in the spring of 1941, when I graduated from Teachers College, they had just got the house wired. And we had very few electric things. We had an electric iron and an electric, I think my mother had an electric beater. And there was no such a thing then as electric kettles and electric, even washing machines had not really, not very, they may have had them in cities or places, but the washing machines were not very common back then. 
How did you heat your home? Well, our home was heated with two wood stoves, a wood stove a range in the kitchen, and a living room stove to heat the rest of the house. Some houses had furnaces, so we didn't have a furnace. And down at my grandmother's, they had a furnace. But when I was living home, we didn't have a furnace. And that was my, through my high school days, I was home pretty well. And uh, we had to pile, we had to get the wood in the summertime. And we had to pile wood and get into the woodshed for the winter. And there was a lot of work to that. As soon as we got home from school, and, you know, cut the wood, mainly, well, they used to saw it. They used to cut it through the winter and saw it in the spring. And then after it sawed and dried, we had to pile it into the woodshed. And you had to pile it right. If you didn't get the tear right together, balanced right, it would fall down. Then you'd have to do it again. So that was every spare minute we had to pile wood. And uh, that was that was the heating system for quite a long while. So, what did you do for fun? Well, for fun, when we had time, we well, we lived in a small town, and uh, in the summer there was, you know, ball games and a lot of swimming. We did a lot of swimming in the river, and and uh, just a sort of. Around town, you know, we, every time we, well, I suppose when we were about 14 or 15 years old, we were allowed to go to the dances. And back then, it was all square dancing. And the main dance on the mirror machine was the, was the Lancer. Now, over here in this area, it's polka. And I had to learn, after I came here to Coles Island, I had to learn the polka because that was the dance that they danced. And uh, I boarded at a, with a lady in uh, Coles Island and she was bound and determined that I would go to the dance that was coming up the next week. And she taught me the polka. <laughs> we danced the polka around the kitchen there for two weeks before the dance. And I did get onto it. But it, there's, a, there's a particular step in movement, so that was a lot of fun. So by the time we got to be 14, 15, my sisters and I were allowed to go to the odd dance. We didn't get out every Saturday night, but once in a while we talked my mother into letting us go to dance. <laughs> and we skated in the wintertime, and I guess those were the, the chief activities. Well, we're seven children, my mother and father. My mother was a teacher, and uh, she had taught for oh, 10 years before she was married in various parts of the province. My father worked for the Miramichi Lumber Company. Uh, there was a mill, but he never worked in the mill. He worked out on the raft boats. And in the wintertime, of course, they, were, they went to the woods. They worked in the woods. And uh, he spent pretty well every winter in the woods. So that left my mother alone with the seven children. And one winter, I had the scarlet fever. And we were quarantined. And for the, oh, I don't know, six weeks or something like that. And that meant that you couldn't go out. You weren't allowed to go anywhere in the village. You couldn't go to the store. You couldn't at the post office, nobody could come in. So the neighbors would get our groceries and leave them at the gate, and Mom would go out to pick up the groceries. <laughs> That's the way we, well, that month of January, I guess it was, and we had the scarlet fever, so. And uh, I had three, three brothers, and four sisters and we all managed to get school get through school and uh, get started in some sort of a career I was a teacher and my next sister to me was a nurse 
And my next, my two, my two young sisters, well, one was a, she worked in the telephone office until she got married. And my other sister clerked in a store. And my brothers, or uh, one of my brothers is a, was a engineer. And uh, one was a, a forest ranger. He lived in Gagetown. And my youngest brother is a priest. So we all managed to grow up and get some education and started in some sort of a career. When it came time to buy food for your home, where did you get the supplies at? Mainly, the major grocery store at that time was in Chatham, and they had a delivery service. They came every week, they came and took your order, and then the next day they delivered the food, and that would have been in the wintertime with a horse and sleigh. And that was Logie, W.S. Logie's, which is the major business that supplied the food. But of course we had we we had a pig, and we so we had to, they always killed a pig in the fall, and we had salt pork, and we always had a bushel or a, what did they call that for a, a salt codfish, it, it a kettle, a kettle of cod was it was called, which was a bale of salt cod, because it's the the cod was salt in one big, one big codfish, you know, and that that was always on hand for the winter. And we had a cow, so we, mother, my mother made our butter, and we had our milk. We didn't have to buy milk. There was no place back in those days really to buy milk unless you bought it from a neighbor because there was no milk delivery like there is today. That didn't start until I, after I was away from home, I think, before they ever started being able to get milk at the store. And uh, in the summertime, we had an ice box, and the ice, they used to come around once a week with ice, and you got a big block of ice. To, keep your milk and your butter and whatever else you had in the perishable line. Of course, in the summer, we pretty well uh, bought uh, meat at the store. Like there was a butcher shop that uh, sold just meat. And there was also two, uh, two uh, butchers came around. Uh, one came on Saturday and one came, I think, on Wednesday. They came around the village to the houses, and you bought just enough to do you for a day or two because they had, didn't have any way to keep it, really. There was no, no refrigeration. Some people had an ice house. Now, my grandmothers had an ice house. We didn't. But uh, down at my grandmother's, they had an ice house. So everything in the summertime went into the ice house, and you had to go out at summertime and dinner time and get the butter and get the milk and that was one of my jobs <laughs> I had to go out and get the stuff out of the, the it was a the ice house had a like a cupboard in the side of it and you opened the door and there was a little quite a little box and that's where the butter and the milk and anything else perishable that was on hand was in that little place <laughs> you have to go out and get that but uh, and of course, we didn't have any luxuries. There was nothing, nothing prepared like there is today. You had sugar and flour, and and you had to make bread. Everybody made their own homemade bread. You just there was baker's bread available, but it was very rarely that ordinary people, you know, bought that bread, and. Uh, well, in our house, we I think Mom made bread at least three times a week. And you set the bread overnight. Back in those days, we just had the dry yeast, and you set the bread overnight. And uh, so for three nights a week, you had to set bread. And that was one of my jobs. I learned to 
make bread when I was about 12 years old, I think, or younger. Learned to knead bread, and it was a full-time job. <laughs> Can you tell us a little about your Christmas at home? Well, uh, Christmas was not much like the Christmases that young people have today because, well, as they say, back during the, when I was growing up was what they called the Depression, which is something like what we're having today because there was a lot of unemployment and wages were low and so there's very little elaborate Christmas. A lot of it, Christmas was homemade. Like we, we always had lots of cake, uh, different you know fruit cake and special Christmas cake and donuts and things like that that were made at home. And then Christmas we got a certain amount of candy and a, an orange, and that was a big thing to have an orange in your stocking because oranges were not very plentiful and pretty scarce. And uh, as far as toys were concerned, well, the girls, I never really had very many dolls. I had a few dolls when I was growing up. And uh, we didn't get elaborate toys and things like that. The boys got, we got a sled one Christmas, I remember, a, a new sled. We, we'd had an old sled that wasn't good, but we had a brand new flyer's sled, which was quite a thing. And uh, we all had to share that. And uh, so we got a lot of knitted socks and sweaters and caps and things like that that my grandmother made. Me, made. And... Uh, Clothes to wear, and you always got something to wear to school. Had a new so, new sweater or new skirt to wear to school, but it had been made by somebody, but probably my aunt or my my grandmother. Mama didn't. Mama wasn't sewer. She didn't sew, but my grandmother sewed a lot. And uh, big highlight at our house. My mom, my mother had a sister who lived in Boston. And she didn't have any family, just she and her husband. And Aunt Mary sent us a box at Christmas, a huge big parcel with all sorts of odds and ends from Filene's basement, which was the big, uh, well, similar to the Kmart, I guess, today, or similar to the dollar store. But she would send us this big, huge big parcel and we would wait for that to come and go to the post office. We got mail twice a day in Douglastown and we go to the post office every morning and every night waiting for the parcel and mom wouldn't let us open it. She wouldn't let us open it till Christmas day, uh, Christmas Eve and we opened the parcels. But yeah, we'd feel it and pump it around and see what we could put guess what was in it and so on, but that was one of the highlights of our Christmas. Would you like to share about any highlight in your, highlights in your life? I never traveled very far when I was young. We didn't have a car and we didn't travel very far, but uh, one, when I was about, I wasn't very old, I might have been 14, but my, uh, there's another lady going to St. Anne de Beaupre on the train with her niece, and Mom arranged for me to go with them, and that was the first time that I ever was on the train, and we traveled up to Quebec City and then down to St. Anne's and spent two or three days there, and that was the first major trip that I ever took. It was, it was quite a, quite an exciting trip for me. And I never, I uh, traveled on the train a lot after I started working because the train was the main transportation in those days. And uh, I uh, traveled on the train quite a bit. But uh, that was my big trip. 
Uh, after Quebec City. Cambridge Narrows Community School would like to thank you for sharing your life experiences and hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Well, thank you very much for coming, and i glad to meet all you young people, and I hope you have a good, successful year at Cambridge Community School. I'm Carrie Thorne, and this is Jamie Bedford. Thank you for this opportunity, a legacy of history project.